Let's get right into this. I'm in the process of building a multi-laminate, multi-scale, did that the wrong way around, uh, semi-hollow body, should be pretty gorgeous uh, version of the Nebula guitar I built a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm having a total blast. This is going to be a fun build. Burn it. Ah, <laughs> yay! At this stage, I've got a fretboard, I've got a neck blank, and uh, I need to join the two in never-ending holy matrimony. Now, in order to do that, I need to install a truss rod. And today, because, you know, I'm bored, I'm not going to use the easy method that I've used in literally every one of the guitar builds I've ever done on this channel. There are like 1,200 plus videos up on here at the moment. And whenever I install a truss rod, I use a router because you should. Not all of you have routers, though. So today I'm going to do something different. Uh, before I get to that, though, this new neck blank needs to be uh, roughly dimensioned down to its final size. It is seven days, six days since I glued it up and uh, it's settling, but I want to see if there is going to be any movement uh, moving forward, I, I don't think so. It's multi-laminate, it's there's seven pieces plus veneers, etc., etc., etc. But you never know. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna take this big chunk and make it slightly less chunky. The fretboard is gonna be roughly here. Uh, I need to figure out exactly where the final fret is going to be and get this fretboard to the absolute final dimensions. So I need my fret calculator again. No, I don't. I don't need my fret calculator again. Nobody needs a fret calculator. Once you've got one of these. Uh, where am I? So we're marking where the 23rd fret is on that. And on that. And that's my final cut. Bench hooks are fantastic, but they do work better when they're actually clamped down. And I'm using the Crimson Fret Slotting Saw, which made the original cut, so that uh, I'm not gonna make the, I'm not gonna move the nut in any way. Final dimensions. We are going to be binding it in burl maple to pull the whole guitar together. Uh, I probably should have actually moved that cut the thickness of the burl, but I don't have that yet, so I will do that on a sanding machine uh, in a minute. The question in my head is, do I do the binding here and now, and then glue the whole fretboard on after the fact? Or do I glue the fretboard, uh, resize the fretboard, glue it in place, and then glue the binding on once the neck is made. Let me know in the comments below pros and cons, in your opinion. I wanna see if this neck moves. So I'm going to size the fretboard. I'm gonna mark out, I'm gonna mark out the fretboard onto the neck, get the exact dimensions correct so that we can start dimensioning the neck. I'm going to plane down the size that we need for the binding, uh, sand the edge down, etc. get that prepared, and we will have the fretboard glued in place and then apply the binding afterwards, just in case things move a little bit. And uh, I haven't built a scratch guitar in this environment yet, I'm playing it cautious. Uh, and in case I need to plane down the fretboard in any way, uh, or deepen the slots, which actually look a little bit shallow, now that I'm looking at them. So uh, yeah, play it safe. What we want to do here is get on the center line, work out exactly where the fretboard is going to be, drill our locating holes through the fret slots, and we will then forever know where this fretboard needs to be and we can adjust everything afterwards.
Now that I have the fretboard absolutely in place and I'm happy with it, clamp it down, move it about a little bit, so I have to do all of that again. I drill two millimeter holes through the fret slots so that they're hidden by the frets once they are in, but also I don't want the holes to be where the truss rod is going to be, or if you're using carbon fiber stiffening rods, etc. Uh, you want to go into a place where you're not gonna be running into some something hard. These locating bins are gonna make your life much easier, much like when I was uh, gluing up the neck. Knowing where the fretboard is, I can now cut away the excess neck. I'm gonna leave uh, a couple of millimeters spare just in case it twists in any way, shape or form. So we've got space for the nut, head stock brake angle, giving us enough room to play around. Now, whether I'm making a multi-laminate neck or a single piece or using carbon fiber stiffening rods, I will always add a volute. It's a tensy little bit of extra weight and a whole lot more strength uh, where it counts. Uh, not to mention it's an attractive addition. There we are. Let's mark out the rest of this neck. There we go. The 16th fret is where the body begins. So my neck really wants to be there, there-ish. I'm, I'm gonna make this much bigger than it needs to be. Just there. This will be dealt with later. Now I can remove all of that material up to here. I'm not going to, I'm just gonna chop this section out here just to see if there's any movement up or down. Uh, and I'm gonna sort out the headstock brake angle while I am there. Also, here's my pickup. Yes, okay. Uh, the neck feels solid as all hell, so I am not I'm not worried. I, I will not need carbon fiber stiffening rods. We're, we're pretty much good to go. Now on a normal headstock, that's what we do. We plane it flat and straight, and it's lovely. We here, however, have an angled nut. Uh, now I have two options. I can either put a nut in place, uh, plane on a flat plane back to the point where I end up with a 90 degree angle there, and a little bit of a lip where it goes flat and then down. And that is one option, or the other, which is much more subtle and a lot easier than it actually looks, is to plane this side down a little bit further, and essentially instead of having an actually flat headstock, it's slightly cantered to one side. And that's what we're gonna do. So it's a lot more subtle than you might think. Essentially, it's as if I'm just planing straight that way. So we have a nice straight flat headstock. In fact, it's so subtle you can't really see the curve. Uh, and that is one of those things that I remember overthinking and overthinking and overthinking and worrying about. And in the end, I realized what I needed to do by actually sitting there and doing it. It's a five second job. You don't need to worry about the break angle of a through neck, for example, or a set neck instrument. Uh, physically draw it out and you'll be there. Worrying is good, but there are often simple solutions. Like the a number of you that worry about me putting planes flat down on my workbench, um, instead of like that. Go to Crimson Guitars Extras, there's gonna be a video soon talking about that. Now, I have several options that looks bad. Oh, perspective, wow. Crikey, that's strange. All right, hey, <laughs> squirrel. Uh, 
actually, the, the, the first person that commented on the squirrel hiding in the tool rack back there uh, uh, got a prize. Um, and uh, if you haven't read my reply to you, then shame on you. I could just grab uh, a small chisel and a mallet and go and be done with it. The depth is the issue and it wouldn't, would not necessarily be as clean and straight as possible. So really what we need is a router plane or something like a router plane. Uh, I mean, or, or, or a router, really. But um, I have a router plane. Here's one. Lovely little router plane. Uh, the, the blade is a fraction too wide for what I want. And if I'm going to be making a new blade, I might as well make a new router plane. I buried the lead here. We're making it out of scrap wood and an Allen key. This should be fun. And a bolt. I think we can do it with that. Excellent. So Allen keys are often made out of uh, uh, nice, good quality steel that one can harden properly. Uh, I'm going to assume that that is the case here. And wood is generally made out of uh, natural stuff. It grows. It's fine. That's not funny, is it? So the Allen key needs to go in the wood uh, with a, a locking screw to lock it in place. And it needs to be comfortable to push. The Allen key is sticking out the bottom too far uh, because the hole is a little bit too narrow there. That's not an issue. I'm going to go in with a step drill. Step drills rule if you haven't uh, had the pleasure. That will do nicely. So I need a tapped hole from the back of the what's going to be a blade uh, to just lock it in place against the front. I also think that if I'd started with uh, rectangular stock, this whole thing would have been a little bit easier. Strictly speaking, I probably don't really need to tap the wood. Uh, I could probably just force the bolt through and it would be done. I don't want to do that. Why would I want to do that when I actually have the tools here and it's so easy? We're going through coming up on an inch of material here and that is more than enough. It, it would keep its strength and the tap and hold the bolt in place for sure. I am, however, going to show you a trick. So there we go. I mean, that, that will work absolutely fine. The trick is super good. And while I don't think it's necessary, it can't hurt to flood that with super glue and then re-tap. It, it occurs to me that some of you think that I may have a problem with superglue. And uh, I use it at every given opportunity. And unpacking that, I think you might be right. Uh, where I studied building early stringed instruments uh, at West End College, we used hide glue. We didn't even use that newfangled Type Bond 3. Uh, it was non-existent. Um, there was one other student, though, who had a single bottle of superglue that everyone borrowed, including the lecturer. And uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the lack of such a useful tool back then has uh, informed me now. Uh, I said all of that by way of waiting for my superglue to cure, and I'm going to carry on now. I don't have a problem with scissors glue. It's just good stuff. Okay, there we go. There we go. So that's uh, stronger than it was and perfectly, perfectly serviceable. I 
And while we're here, just a little coat of the Crimson High Build guitar finishing oil. I suspect I'm wearing one too few gloves. We're going to go on to grind the Allen key now. Goggles and hearing protection. We want the cutting edge, uh, the bevel, the bladed bit, to be the first thing to touch. We don't want the whole blade to be perfectly flat. We want it to be angled slightly forward. So that I know what the geometry is, I'm putting the blade in and actually locking it in place with the bolt. There we go. So the, the blade is ever so slightly cantered forward. Not quite flat though, so... That, that, was, uh, that was a little dodgy. But uh, I have an angle. A bevel, a bevel! And an angle, and a blade. I need fire. Next up, I'm going to heat this up to a cherry red color and then dunk it in water and hope we'll have something very, very hard. I will not need to anneal it, after, temper it afterwards. Um, I don't think because it's such a small thing. It, it should be fine. So this should be very, very hard now. And generally what one does is uh, you do that, then you warm it up slowly to a straw colour, and then um, that will be both hard but also uh, supple enough for use. Uh, I'm not going to bother with that at this stage. Uh, the, and the way to test is to see if a file skates off it or not. And yeah, not actually. I could just lie. Should I lie? Can I lie? No. Okay, uh, this, this metal, like I said right at the beginning, it's probably not, it felt too soft when I was filing it, um, or grinding it at least. And uh, yeah, it hasn't really taken. Uh, I found another Allen key, same size, and this time I did the intelligent thing, and something that I urge you to do too. <laughs> Can you tell that I've been watching The Crown recently on Netflix? Um, okay, uh, I've just heated this up to a cherry red and quenched it prior to doing any work on the damn thing. And uh, yes, it does actually get harder. So now I'm going to go and do all the work, grind it, etc. You've seen all that, you don't need to see any more. We'll be back. Uh, without moving cameras about and stuff, making another one. Actually, it took about 12 minutes. And uh, yeah, I'm skating off. I'm hard enough. I am going to sharpen this. I'm not going to show you that process. There is no need, I have made a million other videos, or like three or four on sharpening. Uh, I'm gonna yeah, use a standard water stone and go for it. And uh, well, I'll meet you back in a second when I'm using it. Definitely not the prettiest tool in existence, but sharp, fit for purpose, and I'm happy. That took, not including the time to make the tool, it probably took 45 minutes to actually make the truss rod channel. And uh, I used a chisel a little bit 
uh, in the ends and it wasn't the smoothest of jobs to be honest. I got some shavings but uh, a little bit out there. Now what I would say is the problem with this, two things, because we use the allen key we have a bevel uh, on the blade and uh, that means that it wanted to it wanted to cut into the edges of the channel whereas uh, the sides of the traditional manufactured router plane blade are, are nice and square and uh, that keeps it in the channel. Now the other thing I would say is both of these, the bodies are too small. I really, because of the way that the blade is protruding out like that, I think that having a longer, a longer body would give you much more support and it would stop the blade from digging in. The alternative is an even easier tool and that is to grab a chunk of wood, drill a hole through it, put a chisel in, and then you just tap the chisel through and the, the bevel is down on the chisel and it's supported and it's got less of a less of an edge protruding out. Um, I don't have huge amounts of experience using router planes and I don't particularly like it in this form. However, don't make yourself one. A couple of hours, it was fun. Um, and the blade, I've just done that whole thing and the blade is still sharp, so um, yeah, the Allen key steel isn't actually all that bad. <sighs> I need to drill some holes now. So I went up to the house to get uh, a libation and the rain has come down. This is by way of uh, asking your forgiveness for any noise while I carry on with this video. What the hell is that chicken doing out? Meat spaghetti noodle doodle do. The insane chick. If you didn't know beforehand, I do have children. I have a fretboard, I have a truss rod that is uh, fitting now. That was, that was a first and uh, uh, well, I wouldn't necessarily say it was fun, it was definitely uh, educational. Uh, now the neck is so light, it has not moved. Um, there is a, a, an ever so slight, I'm talking half a millimeter um, forward bow in it that is 100% not an issue. Um, I am going to chop the end off here so that I can put it in the dogs and I'm planing this neck down to final dimensions. There was a debate as to whether I should uh, leave the neck big, glue the fretboard together, i.e. The, the binding pieces, then glue that on and plane the whole thing down. Uh, essentially, if you plane through the joint, you tend to get a cleaner joint uh, than you do at the edges, or at least that's what I've been told. But uh, uh, I'm not gonna bother with that today. I am going to get my neck to size. I am going to then plane the fretboard down to size. Remember, we're putting binding on it later. I will then glue the fretboard to the neck. So when you're planing, you have to check what, which direction the grain is going. And in this case, most of it is exiting, pointing in that direction. Therefore, I want to plane that way. The other warning I have here is that when you tighten the, the dog, here, you're compressing the neck and you might be distorting it. So very, very, very seriously, tighten it as, as gently as you can. It wants to be very loose. Um, but yes, there we go. I'm gonna drink some more coffee before I get on with the um, um, thing. This is my son's mug. I do not think that I'm Mr. Cool. In fact, I think I try all, all too hard and therefore am the opposite. I had a day yesterday, I had to take uh, Tiger the cat, a, another one of these the children named animals, uh, to the vet. He managed to cut, 
cut his toe open and uh, stitches and all sorts and yes this is all while i was making custom tools and things very very distracting you know the concept of flow when you when you just get into the flow um, and it's working and everything's going right yesterday was the the opposite of that Well, there we go. That's my uh, that's my water cooler talk for the day, dear co-workers. Number seven. So, uh, I <laughs> many many years ago now, I fit a uh, Ron Hock blade in what was my number seven back then. I've since put it in in this. If you're interested in blades and planes and things, go back and check that video out. It'll be in the description. Perfect. On to the next slide then. So it turned out that my pencil lines were not quite accurate enough. There is still a gap on that side um, where I thought actually quite a substantial gap, which surprises me. So I've put the fretboard in place with the cocktail sticks and uh, yeah. I've got a little bit more planing to do. Uh, but in this case, what I'm gonna do is mark it with a knife because a knife line is much, much more precise than anything else. Okay, I'm feeling pretty good about this. So I wanna mark out the binding. I am having a total blast here. Okay, uh, we are ready to put the truss rod in and glue the fretboard down. And uh, yeah, it's going rather well. Now, truss rods tend to want to rattle inside of slots. Uh, we need to avoid that at all costs. Uh, once you put a little bit of tension on it, either way, we use dual action truss rods, then that rattle tends to stop. But uh, a future owner, of this instrument will not necessarily know that. Uh, I'm talking 100 years in the future. Uh, so yeah, let us get on with the truss rod now. Masking tape. So take a small section of masking tape, roll it up so that the sticky side is out. And you see how that is lower than it is at either end it's because you've got welds at either end, you want that to be flush. So actually that piece is a little bit big, I will replace it. But you get the gist. Perfect. Now for many years, I would put a strip of masking tape over the truss rod, cutting it so there was only about a millimeter of it either side. I don't actually think I don't think it's 100% necessary. I worry about getting glue into the threads at either end, uh, but I think even if you do, it's not that much of an issue. This is uh, Alkaline Professional wood glue. People tend to ask me in the comments. Uh, we sell it at Crimson. It's an old licensed recipe. Uh, it's Type Bond 50 which is what Gibson used for many, many, many years. That is not why I'm using it in the slightest. It's that I particularly like it. I, <laughs> I put the glue down and then realized that I was being somewhat of a fool. I meant to sand the end of the fretboard off because uh, I cut, if you'll remember, where the 23rd fret is going to be, and I want that to be the end of the fretboard. 
uh, but that's the end after binding has been installed. So I just ran over while my glue was curing. It's called a pre-cure, it's, it's part of the process. Um, and uh, just sanded the edge of that off quickly. It took all of one minute, but uh, I feel it's important to share one's mistakes. If only to preempt you guys, you always spot them. Okay. Locating pins are such a lifesaver. There we go. Uh, clamping call, it's got a 12 inch radius in it. And uh, unlike last time, my clamps are all ready. Uh, I had, a, I had a, one of my favorite comments in the last video. The last one? I don't know. In the video where I glued the neck up was uh, uh, one of you fantastic people. Uh, gave me, I think, eight out of ten for my glue up, and I lost points because I didn't have my clamps prepared and ready and good to go. The fact that this is a genuine bona fide community is one of the reasons why I keep on doing it. I'm clamping up on, from one side to the other. I don't want to introduce any unnecessary tensions and create a bow, etc. That was a tip from another builder in one of the comments. I'm not sure if it was a tip. I think they were having a go at me. You call yourself a luthier, you're introducing tension, and I'd never thought of it that way. There we go. <sighs> I am going to fumble around and clean up as much of the excess glue as possible and see you shortly. One of my favorite tools for cleaning up wet glue inside of corners is just a nice chisel. Use it as a scraper, pull it along and be done. Most of the excess glue has been scraped off. Doing it at this point makes life so, so much easier. Uh, less likely of chip out, tear out, and tears. It's been four hours, which is more than enough time for this glue to cure. Always drop stuff. We have a guitar neck. It is so stiff, yet very, very light. I'm impressed. Okay, I'm gonna actually leave it at this stage. I am thinking back over the sheer huge amount of footage I've given to Letha uh, to put into this episode. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the random plane build. If you wanna see me do a proper, if you wanna see me go in depth into that, let me know in the comments below and I'll do a standalone video for one of our midweek uh, one day build kind of projects. Uh, I'm very, very happy with how this is turning out. And next week, next week, I'm going to have bound it. I'm going to have inlaid it. I know, I promised the inlay last week, I'm sorry. Um, there's gonna be just a fairly simple, uh, I think fairly simple inlay at the 12th. I'm gonna to talk to the client about that. Uh, I will install the frets. I will then leave the neck and start on the body. This build is going to start coming together fairly, fairly rapidly. A gorgeous neck. See you soon. Click like, subscribe, share with all of your friends. <sighs> mm -hmm. See you soon. Goodbye.